Top Bird Talk. Monty Mython here. As we prepare to move into the next phase of the COVID crisis, we're going to be widening our focus here on Top Bird Talk. We will continue to deliver COVID-specific programmes, but we all have a huge additional responsibility as we try to reboot normal services. So although this piece is not directly related to COVID-19, we believe it's information that is crucial to the bigger task of rebuilding the healthcare system as we learn to adapt and live with this new virus. Thank you to our sponsors and to you, our listeners, for helping us to share this important information. This piece is presented by Desiree Chapel with Monty Mython and Dr Simon Davis, consultant anaesthetist at York Teaching Hospital NHS Foundation Trust with Timothy Miller, Associate Professor of Anesthesiology from Duke University Medical Centre. Have a listen and enjoy. Um, this is from HB, an 85-year-old fractured neck and femur, never had never been to the hospital before. BP on arrival in theater is 195 over 110. How and at what would you maintain their blood pressure post a spinal? De- I'll go first. first. Simon. <laughs> um, how or what would you maintain their blood pressure? First of all, I'd make sure they were properly hydrated. So I'd fix flow first of all, so I'd give some fluid. So that fixed the problem. And then low-dose vasopressor, looking at the physiology of having a regional anaesthesia. In terms of what threshold, I would feel really uncomfortable setting that blood pressure at 65 as a mean arterial pressure, despite what the, the evidence shows. 65 is really the cusp of where harm starts to occur. That's walking onto the edge of the cliff. And certainly for a, a patient like that, I want to be you know, much more towards the cliff face rather than the, the plummet at the end. Um, you know, and I would go for 20% from baseline. I would feel safer doing that. Mm. And that, that's, uh, that's eminence-based? No. Eminence. Eminence-based, yeah. Eminence. Not evidence. <laughs> Not evidence-based. Uh, the fact that they are having a spinal, does that help you that hopefully you might be able to talk to them a little bit or judge it by conscious level? Or I mean, it's, you know, as we say, when we, we reviewed really hard, we looked at the data really, really hard to try and address this question of adjusted for baseline BP. And there's, a, you know, there's plenty of data there to look at associations. And our conclusion was that um, there isn't a lot to gain by the adjustment for baseline. It's not as compelling as one would think, but those are pure associations. They you are. Know. I think for population, yeah. that's a great baseline to start off with. So, so it's, a hard, it's a hard deck. Like go, and for this case, you'd probably, that 60 to 70 th- threshold, and now you've got a 75 from Andy's, Andy Shaw's group, Maybe you'd say, well, whatever it is, don't go below a hard deck of a map of 75. Uh, I think well, that's, that's the absolute lower limit that you want to go to. And you can chat to the patients. And, and these yes, are all opinions, aren't they? It's all opinions. Yeah. Uh, and chatting to the patient, yes, they're celebrating. So you know you've got some cerebral regulation. The, you know, the pressure there is just grand. But what's happening to the kidneys? That you can't measure currently. And their autoregulation points are in different places, aren't they? Yeah. So, so, and do you use cerebral near-infrared spectroscopy at all? Do you believe that uh, customised? Never use it, not in the UK, not that side, cardiac anaesthesia. Yeah, what about you, Tim? Uh, uh, yeah, I completely agree. I think that um, um, practical points, you'd tailor your anaesthetic technique to try and reduce hypotension. I mean, I'm not going to go into details of how you do the spinal or how you do the GA, but whatever you're going to do, you would try and reduce hypotension. You give fluid first before you... So to resident, do spinal, don't you? Pardon? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Up uh, in the office. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you give fluid first before you um, do vasopressors, and undoubtedly you would end up giving some vasopressor. And again, I would not be comfortable with a mean of 65 to 75. I, would, I again, would, would push a little bit higher in that kind of patient. And, I mean, a, a drop in pressure here is completely predictable. Yeah. Have you moved at all to using low-dose norepinephrine infusions as opposed to waiting for the hypotension and giving pushes of metaraminol or whatever you used to do before? Yes. Yeah. I mean, a little bit more... I mean, we, don't, we haven't got HPI, but a little bit more up front in using uh, starting vasopressors early. What, yes. what, what, what? But we, we're phenylephrine. We don't use... Inf- infusion or, or push? Um... Either or. Um, anyway, a round induction of, of a GA, for instance, often a little bit of phenylephrine or ephedrine, depending on the patient, around the time, knowing that we're going to get a drop whilst we're giving fluid. Um, and we tend to give a, about a litre of fluid up front around the time of induction. 
So I know we're moving on to GA, but just you know, being a little bit more cautious with our induction agents, giving the fluid up front, giving some perhaps prophylactic something, whatever it is, I think all the, the, seems to the make... The there is giving the fluid as well at the start, isn't it? You yeah. don't want to be squeezing an empty tank. Uh, and what you often, not often see, but occasionally, someone just starts a vasopressor, and then every response to hypertension is to increase that vasopressor. Uh, and you very rapidly can get out of control, and, and you forget about flow sometimes. Yeah, ideally you'd give all the fluid first before vasopressor, but we know in practice you can't get fluid in that quickly. So a little bit of temporizing vasopressor whilst you get the fluid in, I think, you know, it's just a sensible approach. Yeah. Uh, and if anyone's got strong opinions about this uh, from the floor, don't hesitate to chime in, because this is... As soon as we get to something evidence-based, we'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be today, will it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, this is from Vicky in Charlotte. So, hello, Vicky. Thank you for listening. Uh, what is the best and safest way to attenuate sympathetic responses intraoperatively? Uh, Tim, do you want to take that one? No. Okay. <laughs> Simon? <laughs> uh, where, where are you on the beta blocker? I mean, that was brought up earlier as a co-algesic and also mm. obtunding the response to intubation. Are you using more beta blockade? Yeah, we are. I mean, I think the you don't need to give an opioid to put a tube in. So, I mean, you don't... If you're going to have a... a um, I know we had con, you know, slightly conflicting stories on what we do, opioid-free or, you know, um, or use long-acting opioids, but I think that the most in, important thing is for, for, for very, relatively minor surgery. We have a lot of surgery that has minimal pain post-operatively. Um, or you're, you know, you're putting a tube down and you're going to have some you know, lesion removed on a vocal cord or, or, or whatever. Um, and you don't necessarily need fentanyl just to, just to put a tube in. And, and using some esmolol, you get a very um, smooth induction. And I think it works very nicely. And so we, we do that uh, uh, relatively commonly um, to attenuate the, the sympathetic response. Uh, and, it, and it works fine. Cowboy. You don't? <laughs> 20 mils of propofol and a milligram per kilogram of esmolol means hypotension. I, think I, I, I don't use beta blockers. I, I think it's a UK thing. We just don't tend to use it very, very often. But I, I'd be quite concerned about giving a reasonable dose of beta blocker immediately after induction just to attenuate a bit of... Yeah, that, Maybe that, in a select population, it's, it's useful. But as a routine, certainly, certainly not. When you do it well, um, <laughs> <laughs> they don't give a particularly hypotensive, and you just you give it, you know, thirty seconds before you're about to instrument the airway. It it, it can be very smooth. You're yeah. not probably what, you're not giving a ton. I mean, you're not giving a huge dose. I would imagine. No, I tend to give twenty to forty milligrams. Okay. Try it. <laughs> Try it. You might like it, but again, not evidence based. So um, is there a role for oral alpha agonist, um, for example, minadrine to manage hypotension in the post-operative period? I think we're certain we know we don't know. Mm. Well, does anyone do it? Anyone here do it? Like, I am ephedrine has been, uh, some people will use that, I know as well, but we don't routinely. I think that the, the, what we'd still all be concerned about, I'm guessing from that perspective, is if someone's going to need active hemodynamic management, we have to continue to ask ourselves why you wouldn't put them in a more monitored environment and do it more bespoke for the individual. Now, we discussed earlier why that is a, currently a pipe dream and ambition, but it should be something that I hope we're aiming for. Um, so if anyone uses that and uses that successfully and or has an evidence base, please do share. Um, but I would be wary about this sort of you know, panacea type of things that make the numbers look better transiently. Yeah. Um, this is uh, the Torview model of Ward Plus monitoring and metatarm. I can't pronounce that very well. It's too late today. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm Metarama. American. Thank you. Seems compelling. What are the barriers holding this back? Is it just cost? No, it's not just cost. It's, it's actually quite cheap to, to do and perform. Um, if you've got an area of care where you have sort of one to three, one to four nursing area anyway, then you can implement it. And, and that's the route that we've gone down. Um, you know, our level one plus patients go back to the ward with arterial lines in and they're written up for fluid, they're written up for metaraminol and it's a nurse-led protocol. Um, they do passive leg raises when parameters go outside uh, the usual range or the predefined range. If they're fluid responsive, they give fluid. If not, some, some low-dose uh, metaraminol. And actually, it's cost-saving. For every patient we put through the pathway, we save around about £500. So I don't think it's cost. I think it's it's culture change. It's having evasive monitoring or more advanced monitoring outside of critical care 
that, that puts people off. But with the right protocols, the right governance, uh, the right engagement with the right people, um, then it's very deliverable. And I think that's the hot topic, the very hot topic for proper investigation. Because to, to do it without doing proper investigation, you can do some of that internally to say, did things get better? Did they become more cost-effective? Am I up on the deal? Are my patients doing better? But I also think there's a, a, an international movement, much of it being led out of Australia, New Zealand, to say, well, let, let's try and answer that question. Before, before we wade into all of this, let's try and answer that important question. It's compelling that it should work, but it's also a heavy investment. And also, all these things have the potential for unintended consequences and harm if some people start to say, let's keep them around, measure blood pressure the whole time and treat it all with just vasopressors or all just with fluids. So very compelling, but I say let's try and get some proper answers to a, a good question. I agree, it needs to be done. We, we can't use arterial, line. use arterial lines on the wards, you say? In one pre-specified bag, so it's, it's a very finite area. I mean, we can't, but I, mean, I don't necessarily need, think you necessarily need arterial lines to be able to do that. You just need to measure blood pressure slightly mm. more commonly than yeah. every two hours. Um, and, and you need to have appropriate protocols in place so that the vasopressor is a low-dose vasopressor. It's not something that can be escalated because then you really have the risk of unintended harm of squeezing someone who's hypovolemic. I encourage people to keep an eye out for that. I think some of the early evidence will be coming out in its pilot data. But to my reading, I think it's one of the things I would really go after at the moment and join in with because it should be a relatively easy sell internally to say, you know, let's join in this big endeavour to try and determine if looking after people a little bit more closely and trying to keep simple variables that we regard as important, like blood pressure, up for a, a period of time where there's an association with significant harm, if that produces you know, better outcomes for patients and proper long-term patient-centred outcomes, and it's cost-effective, which it, it looks like it probably is, then that's a big win and takes a lot of pressure off uh, in main intensive care as well. So uh, you know, if, if you get a chance it all happens, please join in. I don't know anyone in Torbay, but they seem to do a lot of things quite sensibly. They're all, that's uh, I mean, <laughs> pragmatic. Not necessarily waiting rev- like the NPO. Mike Swartz from Torbay. Mm. Mike Swartz. Yeah, yeah. Changing their nil by mouth, their fasting guidelines and doing something like that, which seems eminently... They're world leaders. In sensible. Yeah. Of medicine. Anyone here from Torbay? They're all back no. doing that. They're they're all don't, all they don't need to come to this conference. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, all, they're all at home looking after patients properly. <laughs> All right. If harmful hypotension occurs between induction and incision, should we refuse to induce anesthesia until the surgeon is scrubbed and ready? Yes. <laughs> but it's not going to happen. <laughs> we have horrible delays getting surgeons to the operating room. It's amazing. And again, you would think in the U.S. where time is money, that wouldn't yeah. happen. It does. In, in our private practice, we, we don't so much. But so we're yeah. not supposed to. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're supposed to, to confirm that the surgeon, a surgeon, and not necessarily the surgeon, is ready to get going. And it, it's, I think you, know, you should argue it's sort of irresponsible, isn't it, to leave people anaesthetised for a long period of time that, that, when nothing's happening. But it's extremely common. Yep. 10, 15, 20 minutes is not an uh, unusual delay, and, and that's not changed in, in, in decades. To flip it around, we could actually just treat the hypertension while they get there, would be the other. Well, the other half of the equation. <laughs> we have a question from Joanna Coates from New Zealand. So if you're here, great. If you're listening in New Zealand, thank you. If we had better, more specific or sensitive ways to monitor tissue perfusion than blood pressure and now almost discounted urine output, would this lead to better care? I think so. I think so. I think so, but we don't. <laughs> um, I mean, there's sort of two things that sort of spring to mind. One is three block symmetry, which I have no experience with. But there's a, the nephrocheck that's come out looking at um, sort of points of care measurements of uh, proteins that are associated with ischemic load onto the kidney. So you can measure it in, in real time. And there's a, there's a paper in cardiac um, anesthesia post-op where they used Neprocheck to, mm-hmm. to guide the therapy in terms of blood pressure management and you know, dramatically reduced the amount of AKI. Small groups, but you know, it's interesting having this true measure of end-organ perfusion um, I think intuitively leads to better care, but we don't have a huge amount of evidence um, at the moment. Or, I th- I mean, monitoring. My, my deep-rooted prejudice, because it was my original MD thesis, is that gastric tonometry worked, and if it had been given a chance to show itself, it might have been one of the keys in this area. 
Uh, for those of you who are young enough to not know what I'm talking about at all, well done. <laughs> <laughs> but but if, you go, you know, if you go to the uh, uh, animal laboratory, for example, large animal laboratory, we've been doing some work on this recently, and you induce just mild hypovolemia, you can then give a vasopressor and make all the numbers look beautiful, look perfect. You can, lactate doesn't change, base excess doesn't change, urine output doesn't change. You're living in this happy, beautiful world. At the same time, if you put a a side stream SDF camera into the GI tract through an ostomy and you look at the microcirculation, when you give that dose of vasopressor, you kill the surface of the GI tract. It just goes, it just switches off like that. And that's what happens in humans too. And we've done much of that work decades ago. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't kill most people. It manifests itself as post-operative nausea and vomiting, uh, a slightly bloated tummy, and in some people an ileus. But you, you, you've seen it now, Simon, haven't you? It is shocking, isn't it? It's the, it is no, I really... We live in a blissful ignorance. We yeah, can't see it. We look at macro hemodynamics and we think all, all is well. But, but when you de see those images, you think, oh, I get it now. But what, but what if you give a litre or a litre and a half of fluid and then give the dose of phenylephrine? Is it dramatically different? It, it, it is, yeah. yeah. And we, 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 we're a series of experiments coming up to revisit that. I mean, you could just get the papers out from decades ago, but we'll probably revisit it with more recent technology but squeezing somebody who is truly slightly empty, if you want to put it that way, who's already calling upon unstressed volume to serve stressed volume. If you give a vasoconstrictor, you have to rob Peter to pay Paul. And when you rob Peter to pay Paul, Peter is dying. Now, you can get away with it as a transient survival strategy, but it's not a long-term survival strategy. And, it, and, it, and it's very dramatic. So that you could see that very clearly when we were using gastric tonometry in the operating room. People would do that, and the CO2 would rock it, <coughs> And it would make people say, oh, what caused that? When you can visualize it, which I don't think will be the clinical monitor, but it's the clinical educating tool. When you see it blanch and not come back, you think, oh. It's very powerful. Yeah. Um, and it's only with relatively small amounts of hypovolemia that you start to see that, that effect as well. So maybe if you come back next year, we'll show you all those images. What do you think, Simon? Put it off by then? I think so. Should do. Yeah. Be cool. Be cool. Um, HPI is very interesting and clever. Real world, how will it cope? Um, example, the damped failing art line in an obese <sighs> diabetic that took t- <laughs> 20 minutes and uh, an ultrasound to get. <laughs> Never uh, been there before, have you? <laughs> rubbish in, rubbish out. So, um, yeah, uh, you've got to have a good arterial waveform trace. Um, it can't predict any external events. So, you know, clamp coming off, change of position. It's not designed to do that. Um, so it has its limitations. And there's no doubt about that. Um, generally, day to day, the data I so, showed you was all uncensored, real world data from our patients, which incorporates some of these issues. Um, but yeah, there's nothing perfect out there. It has some limitations, but mostly it works and it works well. So I think this is a great question because we talk about the hypertensive patient all the time. I'm sure the data are limited, but what about the fit, healthy individual who always has a low blood pressure? We don't talk about this a lot. I mean, there was just a study that's come out very recently looking at preoperative blood pressure and, and outcomes, and people that had a mean less than... Hypotension was associated with more adverse outcomes than hypertension, particularly a mean less than 90. Whether that applies to the fit, healthy patient, but, you know, the, the, the little old lady that has a low normal blood pressure with someone I'm always very cautious about... Um, I don't think we've got data to say whether that's the same in a fit, healthy individual. But all the big trials excluded people with a map of less than 65, didn't they? Yeah. So that group wasn't wasn't in that yeah. analysis. And and the observational data sets of which some of us in the room have contributed to some of the recent publications, there is there is this U-shaped curve, but usually the the uh, hypotensive cohort are not fit, healthy. They're usually people who are on multiple. Uh, um, meds to treat their hypotension then you do secondary analyses that look at the number of meds and and the hypotension and the relationship to outcomes the picture starts to make sense i doubt very much that fit healthy individuals who always have a low blood pressure should be treated in the same way but again i don't think we have hard evidence i mean that would be sensible to change your threshold as opposed to giving vasoactive drugs to treat something that is normal for them I always think with the little old lady, too, that uh, sometimes people will let their blood pressure trend even lower than what may be well, normal. I mean, many of the frail elderly patients who are on blood pressure meds that were started for a reason a long time ago, that there's now no evidence that they're going to help them 
longer in life that are causing things like orthostatic hypotension, yeah, right. trying to keep their blood pressure where it's been for a while is not rational, I would suggest. Yeah. And, you know, that, that's, I think, is a different thing. All right. It strikes me that minimally invasive cardiac output technology, especially clear sight, may be of much greater value in the war than theater. Comments? Tim? Agree. And I think that it's a huge market, not necessarily for clear sight, but for any wearable technology that can do continuous or regular intermittent blood pressure on the ward and feedback to a central control to hub alerting when you get hypotensive. I think it's a a massive market that, and, and potentially huge benefit. And I, and I, you'd think in 10 or 20 years' time we'll be doing it, whether we will or not, I don't know. But I think it's, it's coming, and I think it's probably coming uh, fast. And some of the articles by Frederick Michard looking at new technologies, nanotechnologies for doing continuous blood pressure monitoring are, are very interesting. You, you touched on postal hypertension in Pocky, because it was that Cessna data, isn't it, that three times more likely to die if you're hypotensive in the first couple of post-operative days. Um, so it's certainly a, a, a good potential market. I think there's some limitations to the technology at the moment, certainly for, for most non-invasive um, sort of finger methods. There's a lot of movement artifact, so that, that would have to be addressed. Uh, and also patient acceptability of it. If, if you had one of those fingers on, a cuffs on for a, a couple of hours, you know, your finger gets a bit sore, it's a bit engorged. Um, so there are some barriers to, to overcome, but you know, potentially it's an area we can have a sort of huge impact with more frequent monitoring. I mean, you know, once every four hours after major surgery, that can't be acceptable, can it? I think, I mean, I, had, I said I had my ambulatory blood pressure done recently with a good old-fashioned blood pressure cuff that you wear for 24 hours and a little box that blows up and down every day. And I, I slept uh, remarkably well uh, during the whole thing. Now, I think if it, um, that sort of technology is an entry level, which is there already adapted to increase frequency of measurement if you're starting to see sags in blood pressure, but leaving you alone, perhaps, if everything's looking stellar. I, I don't I think we, could, we wouldn't have to make a huge adjustment or investment to lean on that development in ambulatory BP measurement to increase our outreach. I think the challenge with lots of the wearables that the people are up against is not my field, but they tell me that blood pressure is still one of the big challenges because a lot of the wearable technology def- depends on uh, using pulse transit times, for example, which is quite a surrogate of blood pressure, then you get into that whole, how many false positives would you to- tolerate? Would you get alarm fatigue? You know, how practical, robust, and affordable will it be? It's, it's going to happen, but I'm sure we could do something um, meaningful in the short term with, with a blood pressure cuff, some finger squeezes, an art line, and a bit of extended overnight intensive recovery. This is from Joanna again from New Zealand. In my practice, we usually detect post-op hypotension, but are terrible at treating it. Should we focus on empowering nurses and junior doctors to do this better? Absolutely, yes. Mostly nurses, because they follow protocols really well. They don't deviate from it. Uh, they're very efficient at delivering care, and they're also very good at getting the right people when you, you deviate from that standard of care as well. Uh, that, that I think nurses should deliver the care in terms of that. And I think the thing we've all been recognised, if you go back to the floor in, in almost every country, every place, if you become hypotensive, you're probably only going to get one therapeutic intervention in the short term, and that's more fluid that you probably don't need. And it's interesting that when you do take those pilots and bring people into a higher care environment, it's not necessarily the fluid they're getting, it's the vasoactive drugs. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there aren't many places where it's routine to be able to give vasoactives on the floor. I don't know if I'm misrepresenting that. Is it? Can you? Can you give start no, norepinephrine no. infusions at Duke on the floor? No. no. When we have what's called step down, which is a slightly higher nursing level, we still can't do arterial lines, we still can't do vasopressors. So they have to go to intensive care or stay in the PACU overnight. Yeah, that's us, us too. Um, it, you know, one thing though is like standardizing the protocols because a lot of Surgeons will say, or, or anesthesiologists will say, we we have our protocol, and this is what you're supposed to do. But it's really not standardized throughout the department, or you know, for all of the nurses, it's just for one particular doctor. So I think they're still straying away and creates a lot of confusion. So standardizing and protocolizing everything for everybody, I think, seems like the yeah. agree. And I, and I try very much when the patients in PACU to make a call on whether I think they can go to the ward or not, because yeah. you know. As someone alluded to in one of the earlier questions, part of the U.S. model is that patients do stay in the PACU yeah. area. It's a big area with lots of you know, walls between bed spaces. And, you know, patients can stay there for a long time. It's more like a 
looks more like a wart than probably what you'd think of as a recovery area in the, in the UK. So patients do stay there for uh, you know, two to four hours after major surgery. So you have a chance to see how they are post-operatively. And if they are struggling with blood pressure then, you undoubtedly are going to continue to struggle with blood pressure. Yeah. If you're not, then you know, generally you, can, you, know, you feel more confident that you can send them to a ward environment. We know hypotension is bad, but is there any evidence that treating it intraoperatively improves the outcome? I mean, the only really intervention study so far is the IMPRESS trial, mm-hmm. which um, um, obviously did show improved outcomes. And I think you can say that some of the goal-directed, you know, the Fedora trial, as I alluded to, um, did do, do goal-directed hemodynamic therapy. So fluids first, then 25% of patients got vasopressors, and again showed a significant improvement in outcomes. So... We've got some data, although not masses. And, and almost every, I think there's over 100 now, um, and many of them very small, many of them are single centre subject to lots of bias, so-called goal-directed trials, usually have a blood pressure threshold. Mm. So there is, there is some evidence you could extrapolate into practice if you were trying to work out what to do. But that, commonly that BP threshold was a map of 65, but almost none of them said, don't worry about the blood pressure. So when you then look further into them, like, our original work, for example, the goal-directed group tended to be vasopressor sparing, if you see what I mean. So they were getting far fewer hits of things like phenylephrine to treat hypotensive episodes, which might go with stability. But that's a lot of extrapolation. I think the, the big, the big uh, uh, which is the, the new um, big multi-centre factorial design trial that's about to start of the series of... Um, come on, guys, help me out here. Heard about it in Prato. One of, one of the squeeze. squeeze. No, squeeze is the observation one about vasopressors. Yeah. There's the new factorial design tranexamic acid blood pressure. So poise three. three. Poise three. Poise three. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so poise three, I think, has started, isn't it? And that's a yes. large. That's a large. Maybe some investigators in the room can put up as well. As far as I understand, that's another one of these massive multi-center uh, pragmatic trials with a factorial design that I think is tranexamic acid. Yes, no. Blood pressure thresholds. Yes, no. If anyone wants to speak up to, to inform us more accurately about that, please do. But I think that's poise three. Yep. yep. Okay. Yep. So um, how much does a closed, list of, <laughs> closed loop system cost? Are there closed loop systems available now for um, vasopressors or fluids? Or uh, no, no, the only one that uh, we have is, well, it's Jay Reinhardt from um, UCI and Alexander Houston. So we got it off them really just for, for basic science and, and proof of concept. So it's not commercially available yet. Um, It'll cost pence and be sold for many pounds. <laughs> it happens. Um, does HPI work in patients with atrial fib? Uh, yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. Simple as that. Um, the atrial fibrillation may be a cause of instability, so it might be quite high, but that's because you're likely to become hypotensive, but it works um, perfectly fine with them. The, the word of caution is then when you're using secondary parameters such as dynamic elastins, how do you then decide whether someone is a preload responder in order to be able to use that parameter effectively and that's slightly more complex. Um, this is from Simon. I'm assuming that you haven't been putting questions in up here. Opioids do reduce the incidence of awareness around induction, especially in the rapid sequence. Well, sequence should we take that, I think scenario. taking that as a statement. Yeah. As the, I think that's aimed at you. Yeah, yeah. and we, we, use, we use BIS monitoring and, and often we'll put BIS monitoring on preoperatively. So, you know, BIS monitoring is not perfect, but I think it can give you uh, an idea of where you are. And uh, yes, I mean, I think you have to factor that into your anesthetic. Okay, this is from Richard. There could be unintended anti-ERAS consequences with continuous monitoring if we hinder mobilization and inflate the sick roll. So, yeah, I, th- I, I agree. Uh, I mean, I think you, you do the two things in parallel. I think that if you can drink, eat, mobilize, then you should back off on the monitoring because you're fixed. You know, it's, a, it's those patients that you find that you try and mobilize who have the orthostatic hypotension, mm-hmm. who feel a bit sick when you set them up, is taking you down that track. So I think that is a, a potential un, unintended consequence is we might go back to shackling people to the gurney, whatever it is, and that we have to balance those two things off. Uh, but my, my impression of our SICU is if they're doing laps in the morning and they've had breakfast, which is what our goal is, then you don't need to measure their blood pressure very often. It's usually those patients in the middle of the night who are starting to get into trouble that aren't necessarily getting monitored on a regular basis. And there are some monitoring devices that don't mean you're tethered yeah. at all. So, again, it may, it, they, they may not be at odds with each other. 
How does a closed loop vasopressor system incorporate other blood pressure affecting factors like fluid, blood loss, pain, or clamping? Uh, it doesn't. So it's a very simple, the input is the mean arterial pressure. Uh, the controller is a program to keep the, an infusion rate uh, with the limits that you set. So if you cause them pain, blood pressure goes up, it will drop the vasopressor infusion rate. Um, same for clamping. Um, the problem with closed loop systems at the moment is the, that they focus on just one aspect of care. Um, so it purely looks at vasopressor delivery. It doesn't take into account whether you need fluid. It doesn't take into account whether your contractility um, has changed. It doesn't take into account depth anesthesia. It's very one-dimensional. But as we progress over time, once we refine these single uh, parameter management systems, we'll start to see them integrated better together. Um, and one of the dangers of closed-loop systems at the moment is just that. If you were slowly bleeding a patient out, it would just increase, increase, and increase the vasopressor to maintain that blood pressure. But it's early days for them, yes. So um, the, uh, there are people, that, there are groups out there working on integrating as many signals as possible to improve it, but I think at the end of the day, uh, I see it as being a much more like a sort of autopilot idea. Uh, I do more sailing than flying. If you're sailing and you put the autopilot on, you're, the helm is still your responsibility. You're basically saying, I want to hold this course while I make a cup of tea or go for a pee, but I'm aware of the conditions and I'm not putting it on, and I'm only putting it on transiently if I think that we're in a good situation. If I'm heading straight towards a spiky rock that I didn't spot, or there's a big squall coming or a storm starting, then I made a bad decision and the outcome will probably be poor. But, you know, so, so I don't think they, it's not devolved responsibility. It, it just improves your time. It's the time. cruise control in your yeah, car, isn't it? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if anybody, has a, if anybody has a question that's kind of lower down, just like Tim, feel free to, to, to <laughs> ask, grab a microphone and ask it if you really want to know the answer. We'll keep going on Sido right now. Don't squeeze, don't squeeze an empty tank, but is the tank in fact empty? Might we push a little of unstressed volume and venous recruitment during induction? If you're putting positive pressure in the chest, and this is very old literature that we're going to have to repeat some of these experiments with modern techniques, the answer is no. That's a, that's a false paradigm. If you're not putting positive pressure in the chest, it's a true paradigm. So in other words, if you were uvolemic to begin with and you're not putting positive pressure in the chest, you can change your venous tone and maintain end organ perfusion adequately. You have to go quite a long way back in the literature. I unfortunately, I had to read it to write my thesis. If you put positive pressure in the chest, you have a transient period of central hypovolemia while your body is confused. And if you then squeeze before giving volume, you compromise splanchnic perfusion. Because it's just it's a false it's a false physiological paradigm shift now. And that's uh, a lot of that literature is critical care, positive pressure, PEEP related. But if you start to think it through, you can say, oh, I kind of get that now. Now we can we'll be showing that to you soon with microcirculatory changes. But once you put positive pressure in the chest, you've changed the game. Uh, it, it comes back on its own with time, but in that window in between, uh, you can you can transitly adversely affect microcirculatory perfusion. So the unstressed volume is still important, basically. Yeah, it's not. There's, 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 no, there's no there's no free. Well, there is a little bit of free volume around. You keep some of it in your spleen, etc. But the, the liberating the the uh, unstressed volume, which is in the vessels that are doing all the work, really, compared to the stressed vessels is a nice survival strategy, so you could use that for 10, 15 minutes while you wait for knife to skin, but it's a flawed long-term strategy. So the thing you have to be careful about is if the uh, vasoconstrictor produces a nice transient picture that looks good, you're definitely doing that at the price of something. So if you keep going down that track, you, you might not get the result you're hoping for. I said it doesn't usually, most patients get away with it, but if you look at it in detail, when those patients go on, if you continue down that track, to get persistent post-operative nausea and vomiting, low-grade ileus and then ileus. And the literature is there to join up those dots pathophysiologically. Mm-hmm. This is from Simon. Shouldn't we be using more TTE or transthoracic echo to assess fluid status? Anybody use that? You guys? Are you... I mean, TTE's got a role. As a TEE's got a role. I, I, I think it's in, for rescue, for looking at emergency situations and seeing what's going on with contractility, with, with volume. But for optimization, I think it's actually quite crude as a, as a, as a tool um, to, to look at sort of 10% changes in, in, in stroke volume. For instance, you're not going to be able to get that very easily with TTE. So got a role, but I don't think mainstream. 
Oh, I'd agree. Trying to deliver it in theatre is not impossible. Um, when you measure um, left the outflow track to um, calculate straight volume, there's a, a fair amount of intra observer error. Um, and just not applicable to the mainstream. It's not something you can then give to, to every anesthetist or every provider to give a, um, a measure of volume status. So, you know, very good in the right hands, but probably not for the masses. So I'm going to disagree slightly. I think transthoracic echo is, is going to grow in its popularity and utility in the immediate post-operative period where you're trying to assess that patient in the recovery area and you're trying to work out where to go next. So I think I think I think it's a that, question to answer yeah. Doesn't it? Rather than how you manage the patient intra operative. Exactly. I think, so I think for the evaluation of what might, you do your initial treatments and it's not coming good. There, there are, and we all know the different variables you could look at with transthoracic echo, including you know, uh, the, 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 looking at various different vessels on the venous side, looking at collapsibility, looking at response to preload changes. So, um, uh, and, and particularly as that technology is now becoming very affordable and available and increasingly you know, handheld. I think you'll see a growth in its use and utility. But I think if you, put, if you just look at the four chambers of the heart and you say the heart looks full, it doesn't mean they're fixed. <laughs> no. and, and Simon mentioned it briefly, but I think um, you know, passive leg raises are probably an underutilised manoeuvre for both preoperatively and postoperatively for looking at volume status and whatever monitoring you're using whilst you're doing that. But I think that we probably should be doing that much more often than we do. Oh, I agree. You know, if you're treating on the ward hypotension and you want to know whether the fluid's going to work, then put the legs up. And that will tell you in a 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to brush through the last one. Okay, what about intended <laughs> hypotension? Uh, uh, like ENT surgery, how low is safe? <sighs> the... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, we don't know. <laughs> so we, consider, we discussed that a lot in, in the... Uh, well, a lot. It's a recurring theme to be discussed in things like the pokey. And when it's intentional, you know, good volume status remained, maintained, lowering of pressure to achieve a surgical objective that can't be achieved safely another way, then we don't know. But I think the mainstream thinking is unless, unless there is no choice, at the moment, try and keep the map above 65. So it's a balance of risk and benefit. I think one of the worrying things is, you know, the, 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 the old sort of school of spinal surgery said, yep. I want hypertensive anesthesia, but that starts from induction until the end. If it has to be done, it has to be controlled in a very finite period to achieve that surgical objective uh, and then retained to um, normal tension. Yeah. Well, why are we more wary of peripheral norogenaline than phenylephrine? Historical, so no, yeah. Need to get over that, I think. Yeah, that's a rec- it's a recurring theme we've discussed as well. As for some reason, we have this fear of dilute peripheral noradrenaline, which is what we do to ourselves. You know, if someone comes <laughs> running in here with an automatic weapon, now we'll be seeing plenty of noradrenaline, uh, and it will be reasonably dilute by pharmacological standards. But for some reason, if we use different drugs, we treat them differently. Now we understand the you know the risk of it escaping into tissues and causing ulceration, but. When it's dilute and large volume and given safely and well, I, I think it's a fear that we need to work out how to get over. We've tried twice in the last five years to have a protocol for peripheral noradrenaline. That, that sort of beta action is a lot more favourable and makes a lot more sense. Um, and each time pharmacy have you know, pretty much shut us down. And some cult- countries and some institutions and some regions do it routinely and can't understand what people are stressing about. They've been long-term users of dilute nor adrenaline given peripherally to fixing the damage. I, I think, but I think we have to... Re- it is significant culture change. It is. Um, but some centres in the USA do it routinely already, which is interesting. Um, but a number, number of others have failed. I mean, exactly, UVA, yeah. they did it, and then they had a problem because then they had two strengths of norepinephrine, and one patient got the wrong strength, whereas historically you've always had one. So it's, it's a significant change for everyone involved in these post-operative patients, nursing staff and everyone, suddenly... Because, you know, we think of norepinephrine, well, they're on norepinephrine, they need to go to... or noradrenaline, they need to go to ICU. I mean, that's the culture that everyone thinks. So you, it's not an easy change to make, um, even though it makes some physiological sense. And, um, and, and we haven't done it yet, despite the fact that I, I agree that it's probably safe and it's probably fine. But I think there are a lot of change, change issues that will be needed. 
Uh, normal CI or a cardiac index, stroke volume, but low blood pressure, would you treat BP? Yes. yes. <laughs> there you go. Should we just put... Oh, gosh, it came back up. <laughs> so if, that, if that person wants to come to talk to me later, I'll give you a slight different view on that. I would say it depends on whether you're at least one litre positive from starting as euvolemic. There you go. We've had advances in intra-op care, including anesthetic machines, costly surgical robots, and pre-op programs. What collaborative strategies for post-op ward care? We've kind of covered a lot of that, have we? Is there anything? Yeah, so I, I, that's why my, my interest is in this uh, keep them in recovery thing, because I think if we keep them in recovery, we demonstrate there's a lot of hemodynamic instability that can be fixed with the administration of vasoactive agents rather than fluids. That's going to drive the desire to do that effectively and more cost effectively back out on the ward, which I think will drive more user friendly monitoring and wearables. Uh, uh, they'll accelerate that process because people then say, well, you can't keep everyone in overnight intensive recovery. And you said, well, let's come up with a solution then. And I think that will drive collaborative strategies for post operative ward care. All right, well, so that's why I would dive into it and do the studies. There you go. One, one more question yes or no? Should ACE or ARBs be stopped pre op? Yeah. Yes. yes. Perfect. And Everyone... don't start them too quickly afterwards. I see. I have one That's answer. Yes or no? <laughs> huh? That's not what your guidance said. <laughs> Our guidance? Yeah. Which ones? In the pokey, the post op ones. It's a consensus. Consensus. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, gentlemen, thank you so much. Um, everyone, thank you so much for us. Top Bed Talk. Nick Majerison here. Have you got yourself onto edpom.org yet? If not, you might not be aware, Edpom Chicago. Tickets are free for a limited period only. Go now to edpom.org. Evidence-based perioperative medicine. edpom.org.